All right. Um, under normal circumstances, I would tell you now to silent your phone, put them away, and do all of those types of things. But in this case, you hopefully have already come across that little note, which um, you're allowed, therefore, to use your phones and kind of play with this if you haven't had a chance to do so. So we're really excited today to, I think, present for the third time at the Annual Scholars Conference on this ongoing project, which um, is called Digital Humanities and the Holocaust Studies. So some of you may have seen earlier versions of this, but then some of the pandemic has been kind to this project and has left us with lots of opportunities and apparently time, some of us had time anyway, uh, to keep working on this. But before I introduce the project, let me just really introduce um, some of the team members, those that are with me here and those that are in the audience as well, um, as well as one that is not with us right now, at least in this Amal Shafiq. So this you know, has been building over the years, a project that is collaboratively done um, at the Ackerman Center, led by me, but in conjunction with various students. So the ones that are here, Katie Fisher, PhD student to my left, and Belowski Fellow. Yay! Yeah. All right, now you know how this works, right? <laughs> Let's see if you learned something. Piyush Kanga. Oh, let's see it works. Shafali. Yay. And then we have she. Come on. And so what is remarkable about these various individuals that they are remarkable in their own individual you know, abilities. But some of them are alumni, some are current students. Some of them are from the School of Arts and Humanities. Some are from entirely different schools, but they've all kind of come together on this project. So what is this project about? It's largely about um, finding some ways of developing a tool that is both you know, able to facilitate research as well as a tool that is able to facilitate teaching. And you know, in lots of ways, the process of putting those two together has always you know, interwoven these two aspects, but at this point, this is why we wanted to make it available. We are test driving it a little bit to see how robust it is and how it uh, functions potentially as a teaching tool. So that's the goal of it. What more specifically is it is trying to do is to offer really a way to, so to speak, scale up and down um, to provide a way to kind of fall all the way back and see the big picture of the deportation. But then also the, at the same time to zoom in on a particular country, a particular year, a particular month. And then on top of it, and this is now the beauty, um, to provide further contextualizations for these kinds of things. And a very robust and very fluid tool that allows from the larger perspective of the deportations, let's say from the Netherlands in 1943, to scale it down to the historical moments of that time by you know, naming a few in a timeline, but then also um, to kind of dro drop all the way down and to be able to map and to tell the story of, let's say, one particular deportation or one particular individual. So in other words, that you can kind of almost like a lever, bring it up and down of sorts, which if any of you you know, I've done Holocaust teaching, you know how difficult it is, how, how the scale is almost impossible to deal with. And to kind of put now ourselves by using that tool, so to speak, in that position of being able to kind of almost like a lens to kind of pull back and, and zoom in, that's the ambitious goal. So whether that does it or not, you know, we'll see or know a little bit more in about an hour's time, but that's the goal. The other part of this is that it's deliberately intended, and this was one of our big breakthroughs early on, um, two years ago, something, where we had initially started this project and had done a couple of mappings that kind of illustrated scale and geography. In lots of ways, you've seen illustrations like that, right? The camps and, and so on and so forth, and they kind of you know, illustrate the just gigantic nature of this continental genocide. What they do a terrible job at is chronology. They totally flatten it out. It's about scale and geography, it's not about time. And time is really important if we wanna get back into the particular moments of the Holocaust and understand the various moments in time and in particular also decision making. So how did decision making you know, change depending on where we are? 
So therefore, the other element of this is to kind of provide, hopefully, a tool that allows to, quote-unquote, historicize in a slightly different way by really allowing, to the best of their, our abilities, as a kind of tool, not a tool that provides all the answers, but a tool that at least kind of forces us into a different position to kind of move us into kind of reestablishing what may have been available, let's say, in June 44, of the landing of, of the um, Allies and how that affected, or let's say, the, the famous uh, capitulation of the German troops in Stalingrad and what that meant or not. Or indeed, as we talked early on um, yesterday over lunch with um, David Patterson's wonderful lecture, the Wannsee Conference, it's very easy to understand that nothing you know, that the deportations began before the Wannsee Conference, if you just use this tool, and it's also very easy to see that it's not right away in January, um, the day thereafter, that everything, you know, starts up, but it takes a little time. And so you can do those types of contextualizations. And then last but not least, I was given five minutes, they're already looking nervously at me. Um, last but not least, we've been also um, coming in with a, in a different way with one of our other uh, participants, Angie Simmons, codenamed the producer, um, who is leading our efforts in producing podcasts. And so those podcasts have been um, designed also as for us as a kind of learning process by which we try to define what is the cri one critical defining moment in a particular year. Very difficult, almost impossible, but therefore a lot of fun and very telling and very good learning opportunity, and then to do a podcast just around that year. And so this whole cycle of podcasts, and we've now completed 1942, I think. We are calling them the years, and they're also placed into this tool as well, so that they also, again, provide another way into this. So what we have now in mind is not me talking the whole time, obviously, um, and therefore I'm going to get away from this as quickly as I can now and hand over to Katie, who's going to um, lead you a little bit through this tool, and then uh, we'll have a couple more. Piyush, will, you will also you do the singing at the end, right? That's what it was, right? Uh, thank you. What I'm going to do for you right now is just provide a little bit of an overview of the website and this platform that we've built. Five minutes is going to feel a little bit like drinking from a fire hose, what's happening. And then I'm going to, I'm going to pass, it, pass it over to Piyush to talk about what is this data that you're actually looking at? Where did we get this from? How was it handled? The decisions behind cleaning it, which is a really important part of uh, handling the data. And then I'm going to take it back and run it through one case study, so looking at 1943 and the Netherlands and each um, aspect of the, the platform that we built. So you may, some of you may be looking at the code on your phones. Keep in mind that this isn't built to be accessed on a phone because of the size of the visualization. So you may be struggling to get it to load in a couple of places. Um, be kind to us. This is a test run, and it's not... a uh, out as a complete, finished, published project. OK, so this first thing, and to my co-presenters who have now left me alone on the stage, if, so you can watch. If you uh, want to add anything to what I'm saying, please just jump in. Um, I'm the one demonstrating this, but I am certainly not the one uh, who built this or the only person who um, has an understanding of what's going on. I probably have the least, actually. OK, so this, this first part that you're looking at is a circus plot. And it's showing deportations. Uh, you'll see one tag, you know, Prague over here. This little number comes up, and it says how many people in 1941 were deported, you know. Um, and then the, the destination is on the other side. And as you can already see, as I'm clicking around, it's interactive, which is one of the amazing things about using Power BI. And because it's interactive, we can begin to animate, which brings in this time factor, which Dr. Romer was just talking about. So rather than just looking at a static screenshot or printout of a circus plot, you can actually come and manipulate it. So currently, we're looking at 1941. And over here on the sides are the controls for managing this. And in the drop down, it shows the countries where deportations were happening that we have data from in 1941. And as we click on it, it begins to alter 
what's happening. So you can see in 41, um, well, let's start back actually in 39. So the number of places where deportations are happening is quite limited, and as I click through it, it begins to show you the complexity at which deportations were happening across Europe. So obviously, as you're looking at this, you might have a lot of questions coming up. And a big part of this project, which I have personally um, grown a lot in, is instead of coming at this with answers and saying, well, this is exactly um, what we're talking about and why it's important, but to look at this data with questions and very open-ended questions, which plays into the case studies that we'll show you in a little bit. So this is one of the reports. Another one of the reports that we've worked on in conjunction with that is to build out an interactive timeline. And this current one that you're looking at is 1943. And I apologize that some of these uh, tags are a bit too small to read. This is one of the things that um, we will continue to work on making that a little bit larger. But through visualizing the timeline in a circle, rather than a straight line. It kind of disorientates uh, how you're used to looking at a timeline. And I think that's really helpful. A big part of this project is that disorientation so that we can begin to say or ask of this, what are new trends that we're seeing in the timeline that may not have been apparent before? And for me, one of those things as I was um, working through this and creating the, helping create this visualization is that in the summer, there is a lot of activity. And I wouldn't have noticed that before just in the reading that I've done. So seeing that pattern in the data made me think about the Holocaust in a different way, and, and also about World War II. So in a similar fashion as the one on the top, uh, the controls are on the left-hand side. And the way that this particular visualization works is um, you can organize it in a different fashion up here, and then sort of create freeze frames highlighting different aspects. And in the future, we're going to integrate photographs into this as well. So along with looking at um, the year in total, key events, also including photos, and then I'm hoping in the future to also include some video and audio clips. And as Dr. Romer mentioned, another way that we're considering the timeline and how uh, sort of the development of the Holocaust in World War II is happening is by integrating the Ackerman Center podcast. And so here you can see we have 1933 to 1940, and this is looking at one key event. So a student can come and um, enter into this timeline in various points and, and listen, you know, it, manipulate it um, through the circus plot and through the timeline and then also uh, listen to it through the audio. So this is a big picture. Um, and then we have a number of case studies, actually. And some of them are, so on, the ones on this right-hand side are using a different visualization software. And it was more of a static experience. So you'll see um, in those case studies, I'm not going to open all of them for the sake of time, but it's a JPEG of the graphs. And the ones that we're currently building, the Netherlands and France, are interactive case studies. I think I have it pulled up already. I'm only going to mention this briefly because I'm going to hand it to Piyush here, if you want to come up. And then, as I said, I'll run it through, and, and we'll look more specifically at this case study. Uh, but this is the kind of visualization that we're building. and coming to this and asking open-ended questions. What kind of trends are we seeing in the data? How does that correlate to what we know about the history? Um, come, on, come on up, Yush. So this is the question, where did we get this data? Uh, how was it handled? And that's, that's for Piyush to answer because it's a bit above my pay grade, to be honest. Hello, everyone. My name is Piyush Kamdar, and I currently work as Analytics and Insights Manager at Wayfair. I've been associated with the Ackerman Center and this project from the past five years. And uh, it's been a long time, and the, pro the scale of the project, the scope of the data has grown e eventually. 
So when we started back in 2017, we had about a couple of hundred thousand rows. But now we work with millions of rows and we try to clean the data, segregate it, and put it into the visualization tool that you see on the screen. So this tool, like the visualization part of it, is just 30% of what goes into creating the visualization. The 70% of it is data cleaning, aggregation, transformation, so that it can be made easily readable by the tool so that we can visualize the data. So I will walk you through the journey of the data that we work with at the center. And the typical life cycle of the data goes through three different phases. The first is data gathering, data cleaning, and then data comes data visualization. So when we gather data, we gather data from various online sources, as well as governmental archives, sometimes Yad Vashem, which are consolidated sources. So once we gather data, we consolidate all of them into a single source, either by appending it or by running scripts on coding languages like Python or R. Once the data has been aggregated, the next step that comes in is the data cleaning part. So what is data cleaning? So data cleaning is removing or fixing anything that's incorrect or in, incomplete, duplicate, and making sure that the data is consistent. There are no redundancies in the data, as well as the integrity of the data is maintained. So we'll walk through all of these terminologies when we dive deep into data cleaning. So the first step in data cleaning is removing duplicates. So since we aggregate data from multiple sources, one record might be represented more than one. So we are over-representing some individuals in the data set, so whereas we are not representing some of them. So it's very important to remove duplicates from the sources. Yep, yep, okay. So once we remove duplicate values, we need to make sure that, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So when, when we are dealing with data, there are duplicates and we need to handle them. Once we remove the duplicates, the next step that comes into is managing any cosmetic changes in the data. So there are sometimes extra spaces, sometimes all of it is caps, sometimes there are commas in the data sets, the date format is not consistent, sometimes it's MMDDYY, sometimes it is DDMMYY, sometimes we have year, sometimes we just have month, so making sure that all of, of the data is in a single format, it's consistent throughout, so that it can be analyzed by the tool. The next part is handling outliers. So what are outliers? So any data point that does not fit well in the data is outrageous. We tend to remove those points from the data when we look at it from a corporate standpoint of view. But when we look at the data from the Holocaust perspective, we tend to keep them and try to understand what's going on. Why are the people not following the trend? What happened with those people? What are their individual stories? And it is only when we ask such questions we are able to uncover insights that had never been uncovered before. The next part is handling missing values. So usually when we have missing values in the data, we tend to fill them with the mean, median, or mode which is kind of statistically proven to, and it is also known as data imputation. But when we are dealing with the Holocaust data, we really don't want to uh, put in or mean, median, or mode, or any kind of imputation for the data because we do not, because the, it's a really sensitive data if we're talking about the lives and deaths of people, so we do not want to lose the integrity of the data. So we tend to exclude the records in the analysis. So if you look at the graph, uh, at the top we have a number which is 13,799 women in France. But if, when you look at the different cuts of data, so on the top left you have this chart where, chart where you have 2,983 people. So I only took 3,000 people out of 14,000 people were represented in that chart because a lot of data points were missing. So rather than misrepresenting them, we tried to exclude them from our analysis. And once all of the data, missing data has been handled, cosmetic changes have been done, we make sure that uh, we visualize, the, we ingest the data into a tool like Tableau or Power BI. And once the data has been ingested, we visualize it, 
And then we collaborate with scholars in the field like Dr. Romer, Katie, and Amal, Shifali. And we try to ask questions about data, uh, like is the data making sense? Is, the, uh, is there any existing working theory that the data is proving? Or is it pro proving to highlight a new trend? And if so, why is it so? And then we dive deep into those issues and, answers, uh, and uh, uncover more insights. So I would like to hand it over to Katie. I think that is it. So as promised, now we're going to run one case study through this platform. And you can see the integration between the different reports. We're going to start uh, 1943. And I'm going to look particularly at the Netherlands because we have this case study which is related to deportations of women from the Netherlands. And 1943 was a year where there was a lot of deportations. And already we can begin to see some of the key locations that women were deported from into. And I'm going to go down now to the timeline and say, what are some of the key things happening in the war and the Holocaust in general? Give it a second to wake up here. And I, I isolated previously, as I mentioned before, the summer months. And something that I noticed was in March, I know it's a bit small, you might not be able to see this, but in March, April, June, there were one, two, three, four expansions of the crematoria in Auschwitz. So there's this ramping up of capacity there. And I want to see, knowing that, that that's happening in the spring, how does that affect the deportations in the fall from the Netherlands. So what you're seeing in the circles plot right now is the entire year for deportations. And I'm going to just click down, and this is showing a bit of that animation in real time. I'm going to start focusing in on the fall. And as I'm doing this, you can see that Sobibor, which I just learned out how to pronounce, thank you, Cindy, um, in the spring is a larger percentage. But as I'm, and I'll do it again here so you can know what we're looking at now. It starts out as a larger percentage, and as I'm clicking through it, you can see it starts to decrease, and Auschwitz starts to increase. Until we get to August through December, and it is the vast uh, majority of deportations. But with, with taking that in mind, then, let's go and look at this particular case study of deportations of women from the Netherlands. And what I'm trying to walk you through right now isn't to tell you every single thing about this report because we could spend a whole hour just talking about this Netherlands report, but a brief um, example of what's happening here. And if, if you have time later, if you're interested, come and read this case study. It's kind of our group findings of what's happening in the report. Um, but I'm gonna read you one small paragraph from this report. This dashboard shows visualizations of records kept by the Reich. And I think this is really important to note that these records weren't collected for data visualization. So a lot of what Piyush is talking about is the process of taking something that was collected before computers were even thought of and then translating it into this format. So they were collected by the Reich, which tracked women who were either born in the Netherlands or resided there at the time of their deportations meaning people who most likely left other parts of Europe and uh, had settled in the Netherlands, perhaps because they thought it would be a safer place. These records were digitized and made available by, made available by Yad Vashem. Only records of women with known birth and death, death dates are included in this study. Through the use of new technology to look at familiar histories, we can begin to draw out new insights and gain greater understanding of effects of the far-reaching and multi-continental genocide, genocidal event of the Holocaust. And at the top here, you see born, resident, both, 
residents but not born. And we're segregating the data to say, born is people born in the country, but not necessarily current residents of the Netherlands. Residents are all who lived in the Netherlands at the time of deportation, and both means that they lived there and were born there. And then residents were people who, again, resided there but were not born there. Um, and I want you to watch particularly this graph and this graph as I click through this. You can notice some changes. But one thing that's kind of um, consistent through them is we have a switch in some of these, in this ribbon chart, where women who were older were deported in higher numbers later, and women and girls who were younger deported earlier. So this is particularly noticeable in the data from France, that women of childbearing age and children, girls, were uh, deported and murdered at a higher percentage earlier than older women. And uh, one way that we're continuing on our journey of large scale down to small scale is we went through the data and found one woman and then asked the question, what was her story and can we find anything about her? Because obviously um, photos are a bit hard to find and what the Third Reich was attempting to do was to remove her completely and her children from, uh, um, from memory, from record, and to, to say that her life didn't matter. The woman in this case study that we found and began to re recover her story is Sarah Klut Rudveld. And through cross-referencing the data that we were working with in that visualization with the Amsterdam City Archives, I was able to find their uh, archive card where she was required to check in when she moved. And from 1940 to 1942, uh, when she was murdered in Auschwitz, she has 12 or 13 recorded locations. So you can see during the war years, she was forced to move quite a lot. We also found the archive cards for her husband, her daughter, her son, and her brother. And this case study is tracing their experience in those last few years. So her brother, Nathan, was, had some encounter with the police, and we were able to find those records. And he was then sent to Mansai, did I pronounce that correctly? It's close enough, okay. Um, where he was murdered. And uh, using Power BI, the... Um, data analysis side of our team created this really interesting map which animates those locations that we had found on the archive card. So it's, it's showing um, in time where she was through one circumstance or another forced to move. And you can see from, you can see the street names, you can see uh, some of the canals which shows you that we're really zoomed in. She's moving in a very small neighborhood. And then it starts to get a little further away. And by the end, she's taken from Amsterdam, which her family had lived there for multiple generations. And she's deported to Auschwitz, which is on the other side of Europe. Which gets, I think, to this um, scale issue that it's, it's not just one region, but involving multiple continents. And we created this kind of animated map for each of the members of her family. Um, I think that's what I have. Dr. Romer. Thank you. messy process as Piyush was already learning. I mean, the data itself, just to walk you through this one more time, largely is based on the records that the Nazis kept for the purpose of deportations that recorded then the places of origin, date, 
earth and so on and so forth. Most of that data was then used by Yad Vashem for memorial purposes so that you can go there and look up in a database if you're looking for individuals. And so we extracted that data now for entirely different purposes, as, as you could tell. Um, with this tool now, um, you've seen that we can do a number of things. I'm in particular also intrigued by this last part, this map, because I think one of the other parts that is really interesting to see for the different countries um, at times is how prior to deportations, Jews had already moved around in order to kind of avoid detection in one way or another or for economic purposes. So you find often that also in the German data that a lot of the individuals, let's say, who were deported from Hamburg, that was one of our other bigger um, case studies, actually were not born in Hamburg, but had moved to Hamburg and moved to Hamburg in the, during the 1930s, feeling that they could you know, probably fade in more easily um, and, and be more anonymous in a bigger city than rather the smaller places that they came from. We were also able to extract from some of these data points very specific kind of case studies for example, in suicides. And um, you know, we're able to kind of plot out when they occur and whether there's any kind of way of aligning them with what is happening you know, in terms of the, the bigger picture here. So in many ways, therefore, this data is kind of, you know, kind of the middle of a pile of sorts and allows us to do some of the bigger things, but then we can kind of move into this in different ways. This last part that Katie was explaining was our you know, attempt to kind of think about when it comes to deportation, what are the bigger categories that are affecting who's deported when? And so for one, you saw that we were differentiating between individuals who were born in the countries and those that resided in the countries. So we all know that particular for France, foreign Jews were disproportionately earlier deported than others. So that's you know, one of the categories that we thought was possibly significant. Another one was age, and so you can kind of see how uh, the different age groups in particular uh, are um, affected by that. And then last but not least, also gender. And so this is, you know, you saw now with the, both the French as well as with the Dutch material that we were particularly interested in, in drilling in on the question of, of women versus men. Um, the other thing, and Piyush is actually the one who can do this best, is, and this is really important, what you see is entirely interactive. So you can constantly manipulate, you know, so to speak, what you're looking at, what kind of sampling um, you, know, you want to look at, whether you want to drill in, just let's say, on, on the victims from the Netherlands born there, in the, who were in their 20s, or just those that were in that age group, but for a particular year, and so on and so forth. So you can really thereby kind of engage in a process by which, you know, you, you hopefully will be able to ask some new questions, but hope, hopefully also find some new answers. So this is deliberately designed, therefore, um, to kind of put the student or the researcher or all of us collectively a little bit into the position of being able to kind of see, well, how is this actually working? How did they actually implement it? How do they actually respond, let's say, to bigger historical changes? Is, there, is it random, or do we discern patterns in terms of what age groups, for example, are, are deported early on? Are those things changing over time? Is it is a significant change, let's say, in terms of what we see in 44? Is, is in terms of the, the intensity of the deportations? You indicated some, I think, that was you know, very well illustrated how Auschwitz, in lots of ways, and 43 is being built up while the other death camps are decommissioned. So in lots of ways, the killing sites, so to speak, gravitate geographically from the eastern parts um, rather to the west, which makes a lot of sense if you consider what's going on in the war. And therefore, you see again that movement, or you can also track other things. You can, uh, for the later part in 44, for example, um, and you clicked us quickly through, you could see how all of a sudden there's an intensification of deportations from Westerbrook, from Drancy, from Theresienstadt, all toward Auschwitz, and you kind of see all of a sudden a consistent pattern in these three different locations. Um, and if you think about what that possibly means is that the Nazis deliberately are emptying the transit camps while they still have access to Auschwitz, knowing that that's not always going to be the case. So in other words, 
Um, part of what I, you know, as a historian, got very excited about is that you start to understand that this is, you know, not this bureaucracy. You, you know, this is kind of sometimes the view that we're getting from this, that it's just this machinery that keeps kind of working through a similar process, rounds, roundups, deportation. But you see actually how this in many ways, and you probably heard me say this before in one of the earlier iterations, is very dynamic and very responsive to changing circumstances. But that, I believe, is normally really hard to see. And uh, to the you know, big efforts of our team, I think is now actually something that we can you know, interact more easily, but also something that we, you know, like I said early on, deliberately are now creating as a teaching tool. So as insofar as we're moving our classes around and also are trying to equip students like with new tools, um, that allow them to kind of engage this material in different ways in whatever scale. This is really important for us. Um, we think that this is really, a, hopefully, a, a really good teaching tool. The other part to all of this, and this is also something, I mean, it's also otherwise lost a little bit on me, but um, we've traveled quite a bit through different platforms. And... Uh, Right? I mean, this has been a journey from one to the other, and it kind of looks always the same, but not quite. The beauty of this one is the Power BI is that all UTD students with their ID have access to what's called Microsoft Teams 365, and you can load this into Teams, and therefore you can also work very collaboratively with other teams that you assemble online and kind of have everyone access it. You can have it versions of, of these plot this one, for example, you can have a, as a dashboard on your phone, and you can really, you know, in, in, in different ways, therefore, be in the class and kind of ma manipulate it. Piers, why don't you come for a second and just do this, you know, he's, you don't want me to do this, I assure you, uh, but just as a way of showing how interactive this is. Are you wanting him to just interact in this one or to edit it? Either one, I think, you know, just I this, one. On this one. Just a little bit. Sure, so, like, when you're looking at this particular page, and we want to see what happened with the people in the age group 0 to 20. So when we just click on it, So it just shows you, it filters the data from all the other visuals and shows you what's the age group that we're looking at, what was the year of death. So it kind of minimizes your efforts to look for that data. And there are other graphs where you can actually like, also you can click on any of the graph and then it will filter rest of the graphs and it will reflect the correct numbers. So if you look at 1944, you can see that at the top you have 1,011, which is the number on the top of the graph, 1,011 people, and then you have the breakdown by age groups, you have the breakdown by years, you have the breakdown by year of birth. So it's, it, this tool's kind of intuitive and it interacts with other graphs and provides you a way to kind of zoom in on the data that you are interested in. Can, can you go to the final, or the second to last page of the report? I meant to mention this before, but we also included the names of women and their data points who, oh, it's the, go to number six, yeah. So these are the women that are included in the study, which is quite helpful as a classroom project to say, let's pick one of these women and what information can you find about her life, which is what I did in looking at Sarah and, and um, figuring out if she has children, are her children included in the study? And one thing that would be amazing, Piyush, if we can do is to uh, be able to find or locate these women in the report to say where do they fall. Uh, okay, yeah. <laughs> so uh, this is how we develop things. We just say, Piyush, make it work. Exactly. I, okay. I think we'll have to add that functionality onto the website. Yeah, yeah. It'll be there this afternoon. Yeah. You know? <laughs> the, the last part, thank you. The, the last part also maybe just to emphasize something that interests us a lot that, you know, this is about the, you know, the bigger things that are happening, but in many ways also obviously about victims. And so therefore this, what we call scale is really important. 
But for lots of individuals, we don't necessarily always have you know, the ability to, to locate as many data points as we did in this one case. But what we can do at times is to kind of cluster you know, set together and track them at least on the geography of a particular town. And I think that's really significant because you can kind of see then what, for example, possible age groups or, or others have in common in terms of where respectively they are at which point in time. So you can kind of not necessarily tell their individual stories always maybe as well, but at least you can kind of shed some light on them by bringing them deliberately together with, with other groups. But you can also, you know, track again other things. You know, very clearly the case um, in many locations, Hamburg, Frankfurt, Berlin, and others, that prior to deportations, Jews are already evicted from many of their houses and apartments and then moved into what's called Jewish houses so that in lots of ways their last address, their living space, is considerably reduced, reduced, reduced further and further. Um, without formal ghettoizing, but you can kind of track that as well. So there are a number of ways how you can actually d do some things that explain actually also some interesting aspects of this prior to the respective deportation. Well, it's probably fair to say that we're all tremendously big fans of our own work here um, and really enthusiastic about it, but I think we should now give, right, yeah. give everyone a chance to ask questions. Yes. Do you want mics or do you want to? Yeah. yeah. Who would raise your hand? There we go. Oh, thank and then you. We'll pass. Uh, yeah, first, um, I have three comments, but this one doesn't count. Uh, just to acknowledge the work that has been done to see the building from one year to the next on the material that students have uh, compiled is just extraordinary. I want to comment on, on one case that I worked on where a woman was born in 1856 and her father was born in 1808. So to imagine that this story encompassed all of the 19th century plus half of the 20th century really puts into perspective the importance of the work that's being done on the elderly people. And also um, imagine, and I don't know if the data can support this, but because it was so much harder for the elderly to get affidavits to leave, if the percentage of elderly remaining was larger than in the other populations and, and ages. And the last thing I want to say is there, there begins to be work done, I think, in, in England and in other places with similar projects. And I'm wondering if you have coordinated in any way with the other programs. Uh, maybe if I can, no, we, I mean, not normally. The one part that, um, that, you know, we're really mindful of is that also the testimonies in the Shoah Foundation are not all geocoded. So in many ways, as you're listening to the testimonies, one of the ways by which you can also kind of follow, quote, unquote, the narrative is that it's mapped out. So if there are any specific place references, then you can also... Um, kind of again see exactly where they where they are. So that kind of connects you know very nicely um, with with that part. And two years ago when we were here last, you might remember Wolf Gruner was here and we presented some other you know version of this and he got really excited and ta we talked a great deal about how we will collaborate. But then the pandemic put a little bit of a of a stop in between because we, you know, all institutions started to look a little bit more inwards and were a little bit more occupied with themselves. But I think in the future we want to go back to this. There's also another really interesting part to this that we have not highlighted, and that's the ability to also, you know, analyze a single deportation and kind of talk about the victims on one deportation in terms of understanding something about the geography. So we have, you know, lots of um, you know, initiatives about Latin America, for example, or we, you know, early on, part, one of the impetus of, of this project had to do with us um, working with students who were interested in the Middle East, North Africa. And so we were able, therefore, also in small ways, for example, to um, come to terms with the number of Jews who were killed who were Turkish nationalities, or Jews who were killed who came from Egypt, or things like that. So there a couple of other things. The other question that you had with age, is that? Yeah, and, and ability to leave. 
Um, that's obviously something that drives this increasingly toward the end, that the communities that are left behind are increasingly getting older and older and older. And so that's, I think, something that you can also kind of analyze by this data. If you look at, can you do this for 44? It's also always good. We have always a good hypothesis, and then sometimes they're right and sometimes they're wrong. But I think if we look at, let's say, the deportations from Germany, 44, then we're looking more likely already at a far older age group. Oh, but we only have that for the Netherlands, right? Is that where you're looking at me? Okay, <laughs> e equally true if we're looking at the data, I think, for the Netherlands, that increasingly <clears throat> the, the remaining communities are, are on average getting older and older. Be really interesting to compare the number of single young women who died with the general population of, of married, how it, how it compares. And no, you can do it with this data. no, very true. And, and you know, I think that case study, um, that was part of the, the interest also, trying to figure out how is her story unique or discrete. Um, and different from that of her family members. Are, are they all moving along at the same time? Are they intersecting and so on and so forth? So that's, I think, what this kind of tracking of movements is, is able to do. But I think we had a, another question, right? Yes. Hi. Just, um, yeah, let me just uh, make two comments. One is, because we've included the uh, data from the women included in this study, I can then filter it to highlight those who have a maiden name. And it's not included in this part of the visualization, but we can see if the, some of them, if they're married or not, so to that. And then the second thing is, um, you can see it in all of these, but older people in this visualization were deported in 43 more often than in 42. So there is this kind of delay, and that, that's what I'm highlighting here in this part of the case study, uh, women 80 to 100. Go ahead. So, you know, first of all, I, I, I've watched the progression of this over the years, and it is really stunning to see how much data has actually been worked into this. And I find it very, it's very moving to be able to go right to one person and really track as you showed today. Um, but I'm, I'm interested in, you know, if, if people were doing a PhD on using this data, using other data, but let's just stay with what's here three years from now, let's just say. Um, what are the, what could you imagine would be the titles of a thesis that would really do justice to the work that you have here? I'm, I'm very interested in where you think this could go in that way. I mean, I'm not going to give it away you know, any titles or not, but I do think that, um, as I was trying to say earlier, um, one of the abilities that this has, and, you know, this is, <laughs> next year we will have a more, uh, you know, elaborated version of this. It is really ideally um, created, or this is at least what drives it on my end, um, to cr create a way of, of really thinking about the Holocaust without the hindsight of the chronology always already in our mind. In other words, to kind of return to these single moments and to see what occurs. And you can load it with photos, you can vote, load it with videos, newspaper articles, and, and so on and so forth. And I think when you do that, you reconstruct, so to speak, another type of a horizon. And it's actually the horizon that was available to individuals at particular moments. So we you know, have on and off, you have heard it again, um, for this conference on Sunday nights, we have always you know, a different type of popular lecture Pedro Gonzalez has given lots of um, lectures together with Peter uh, Kornstein, whose story in lots of ways you know, overlaps with that of um, Anne Frank. And I think when you understand actually the context you know, of a particular moment when, for example, the Anne Frank family made the decision to go into hiding, 
And you can kind of all of a sudden blow this up and say, you know, this is the months when they made their decision. And this is, you know, what happens around them. Then I think you provide far more insight into this than is otherwise simply available, let's say, from the diary. And that's, I think, for, true for any one of these movements. Now, to be clear, as far as the data is concerned, because we limited ourselves, the data that is available as of now is largely about Western Europe. And that was the premise, you know, to make this more manageable for us, um, you know, that in lots of ways, you know, excluded, obviously, a good many other data points. So in that respect, there's still that limitation. It was initially done because Western Europe, you know, in particular the German Reich, um, is, is the one that the Nazis control until the last. And so therefore, part of that project, you might remember it, but, you know, it was actually early on very much about understanding something about the tail end. And that's, you know, to my mind, still one of the interesting questions that we can kind of track through it. But in my mind, it's really a different ability of, of coming to terms to recount the history of victims, um, making them accessible in a different way, but also, you know, really historicizing in a possibly slightly more radical manner, particular moments in time. Give you an example. Um, in January 1943, um, you, you know, lots of ways, it's one of the low points, so to speak, of the war. Stalingrad had just happened. Um, you can very clearly, if you dig into this data, see how the Nazis are reassessing for a moment where they are and how then they are very quickly responding to this in, in this kind of built up that you otherwise already talked about. So you, I think you have really ways to kind of show how in many ways, you know, and this remains actually true, I think, all the way until 45, while they are very ideologically committed, they're you know, exceptionally clear-sighted in terms of what they see in terms of what's happening and what, you know, therefore is required on their end. So I think you get a lot more on what otherwise seem to be these mid-level bureaucracies, um, you know, that work under Eichmann, and you get a lot more agency and a lot more decision-making all the way to the end rather than a you know, as Sigmund Bauman once said, this kind of bureaucracy that just keeps going and going. No, it's actually a very dynamic process. So I think there's a lot of potential dissertations in there. But our goal is to, to be clear again, it's two-sided, teaching and, and research. And I think the benefits for teaching, I think, are very obvious. But I think the benefits for research, I mean, drives part of my research, I, I can also already see. Um, Emily. Oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> well, first of all, I think this is a great and exciting project, and I really love what you're doing there. Um, my question is about those age um, brackets that you've chosen for um, displaying your research. I was wondering what your motivation was to choose those 20-year brackets, and did, you, did that come out of the data you were gathering, or did you use that as a top-down approach just to visualize it? And also, do you think it would change something significantly if you change that approach of using those 20-year increments? Yeah, I think the data did not come with the 20-year buckets, but we decided to go with 20-year buckets to create like six or seven categories. And I am pretty sure like if we change the categories and this is where we need like inputs and suggestions where we can incorporate them into the dashboards and look at the data from a new perspective. So maybe if you break the buckets into different groups, we might find a new pattern, which we haven't uncovered before. So this thank is, you. you know, the part about it being so dynamic. So again, Piyush could do this very quickly and change a little bit the lever, so to speak, and then all of a sudden we would end up with slightly different sized groups. Right? You could do this. I'm not going to call you now on doing this, but you could do it. Hi, yeah, just to speak to your question um, about potential theses, I think that something that's, that could be really valuable that could come from this is, is a study of the kind of migratory aspect of the Holocaust. I think um, the coming together of, I don't know, geographical perspectives of the Holocaust, I think are, I don't know, becoming increasingly trendy isn't the right word, um, but I think there's, there's definitely a trend there and I think the migratory aspects of this research could be really um, fruitful. Um, but I had a question, Katie, I know that you were looking at the, um, 
the archives in Amsterdam, for instance, on, on Sarah, and I wondered what some of the challenges are in collecting this data. So, for example, are there, were there cha challenges there with translation? Um, what yeah, I don't speak Dutch, so that was yeah. a bit hard. <laughs> yeah, exactly, and I, I didn't mean to cut you off, Dr. Baker, did you have something? No. Okay, yeah, this was a challenge because I think uh, there is some more interesting things that we could learn about, you know, why did her brother get deported, but I can't read the police report. And of the endless possibilities of this research required me to say, okay, I need to move on and start building the platform instead of um, diving into that. But the ability that this kind of information has to intrigue means that I think students can find it very fruitful to uh, follow their curiosity about it. So yeah, that's one of the challenges. Just uh, in terms of the trendiness of geography and the likes, um, one of the projects that I think we have partially completed but we're gonna go back to it, is harbor cities. So one of the questions that I had early on is what is distinct about Marseille? Um, and can we see in terms of the the, the, the makeup of the community, is there something discernible? Are, are there, you know, my assumption was that uh, the, the victims coming from Marseille will be more uh, diverse in terms of their places of origin. Is that equally the case, let's say, if we compared with Amsterdam or Hamburg? So that drives sometimes these, these particular case studies that we're pulling together. That, for example, there, I think there's something interesting to be said about you know, the uniqueness in terms of the profile of victims that are, that are deliberately probably going to these harbor cities earlier as a way of still thinking that they may have a way to, to leave and therefore they become the hubs of a possibly already um, population of Jews that are already far more on the move than in other cities. So a lot of them you know, from nearby towns, from faraway places. And so I think that, for example, is, a, is a, to me a really interesting aspect to understand something, whether their locations also in lots of ways create very particular profiles of the victims. Yeah. Yes. See, it's all right there. So you're talking about it and they already have the evidence. And sorry, I think you had your hand up, right? And this is probably, I think we have time for one brief question and, and answer. So with, um, given Hitler's obsession with race, um, I don't know if I'm missing it, but I'm, I'm not seeing that breakdown by race as much as I was expecting. Uh, for example, I, you know, I know that in Holland, a um, higher percentage of Jews were deported than any other place in Western Europe at least. Um, but what about the, yeah. Oh, I see, I see, okay. So, because um, I'm just curious, you know, with Holland, for example, what percentage would be non-Jews or gypsies or other, you know, what, but that's what, not part of the project? No, not right now. I mean, we're just focused, what is, you know, clearly the case, particularly for the countries where the Nazis continued to have control up until very late, that what they define as Jews changes and radicalizes you know, the further you go in. This pertains to the deportation of Jews from mixed um, Arabs. And so you can see that in the Netherlands, as well as in, from the German right, that therefore the core of the individuals that are, we famously Klemperer, Victor Klemperer is one of those cases, right? He's protected different case because of his non-Jewish wife, he's keenly aware in January of 45 that unless this you know, results in him deciding to quote unquote go into hiding, that the Nazis have changed who are reporting that he would be next. Uh, that's one of the famous cases that you have similar cases early on that um, the group that had up until then, the Netherlands been excluded, Jews with you know, non-Jewish partners, are now also being drawn. That's you know, one thing that I'm trying to Yes, yes, we did many more things as well. Um, you know, by drawing really also on the other geographies again, on Egypt, on Brazil, and uh, you know, and we've been tracking victims with, who were born in other countries who often end up because they were visiting France. Um, 
um, you know, they were looking for opportunities in the 1920s and then end up, unfortunately, being caught in the middle of that fight. And being caught in this also, often Turkey is a famous example because Turkey is not very really responsive to the need of its Jewish Turkish citizens when, when it would have had to protect them. So that's the, another part of something that you can track very easily here. The countries that are failing, uh, so to speak, to protect their own citizens. Thank you so much.